And then someone was like, no, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have, we're going to forget about fees. We are going to try to accomplish like the one business model that has not been successful for anything other than a nation state in human history. We are going to create money. Like it's kind of like an absurd proposition. What private company has been like, you know what? I'm going to create some money and that's going to be my go-to-market. Like it's never worked out. Nothing said on ZeroX Research is a recommendation to buy or sell securities or tokens. This podcast is for informational purposes only, and any views expressed by anyone on the show are solely our opinions, not financial advice. Boccaccio, Ryan, and our guests may hold positions in the companies, funds, or projects discussed. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of OX Research. Today, I am joined by Ryan, Daniel Shapiro, and Hayden from the BlockWorks Research team. How you doing, guys? Hey, how's it going? Glad to have you all on today. Um, we've, you know, the markets have been um, interesting the past couple of weeks. I guess I'll just say that. Um, maybe some people are crying a little bit looking at the, their portfolio numbers. Maybe um, others are just hoping for uh, October, the end of the year, to come sooner. Who knows? Um, but there are some interesting kind of topics floating around in the in the ethers of uh, CT and online discussions. So. Um, one of those um, that, that popped up last week was related to Maker DAO's rebranding to Sky, um, as well as to just rebrands in general. But um, basically, Maker announced um, this this new rebrand, um, fitting themselves out as as Sky um, with you know new new logos, new designs, um, new name, all in. Um, it's it's a bit unique. We we don't often see like full naming product like company renames um usually you know maybe logos logos branding colors etc um for like a fresh feel but this is like an entirely new look feel name for the for the team so um i'm curious your guys thoughts there is is there something deeper to this um is it interesting or is this you know just a you know we get a new token we get a new chart and it maybe gets (laughs) gets people excited uh to come and come and look at you know sky instead of maker I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, I think, I think, um, what maker Dow realized is that, um, like it, it feels like crypto native demand for stable coin coins might've been saturated. And obviously right. There's, you know, trillions of dollars, um, of fiat that exists beyond crypto, um, that they want it, that they want access to. Right. So I think, um, currently or previously they were appealing to a crypto native audience, but uh, right. If you look at like Tether's business model or circles, right. Clearly they need to start appealing to TradFi. And so um, I think in the context of trying to, you know, si- signal that, right. They're now branching out beyond their like, you know, original, um, their original purpose, which right was like the, you know, crypto collateralized stablecoin. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, you know, obviously who doesn't love a new chart, right. You know, similar to stock split. So I think, you know, I think that all makes sense. Um, I like the timing, um, doing it now, um, just to kind of get people familiar, uh, heading into, you know, what theoretically could be, um, a good environment for risk assets, um, at the election and, and maybe in 2025. Yeah. I mean, I think those are good points you bring up, um, new new tokens is an interesting topic as well i think you know like some other big examples are like polygon and matic they're they're kind of working on this move to the poll token pol token instead um and we've got sort of some other rebrands as well like from op to sort of like the super chain environment um another maybe more interesting one as well is like redact cartel to dinero um i think their like sort of brand name change um is similar to what you mentioned daniel like going from more of this crypto, maybe CT focused audience to, you know, maybe wanting to, you know, get partnered up with institutions, you you can't really call yourself the redacted cartel. Obviously, MakerDAO is not on the same level there. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it opens up new opportunities, right? Um, printing, you know, not printing, but coming up with a new token, um, having a fresh chart. I, I do question a little bit like, are the incentives always positive for maybe that existing community? You drop a new chart and maybe you're offering up, you know, maybe brand new incentives and um, potentially looking at diluting those existing token holders for the sake of like 
new adoption and new new rewards offerings. Um, that's maybe a question to contend to for sort of like the existing um, community versus like the new community that, that, that team is going after. I don't know how impactful rebrands have been historically. Um, like rebrands take time. I don't think that they like happen when the logo changes. Moreover, like I can't really think of any like product significant like product oriented rebrands other than Twitter to X, which like I think the evidence there is like Elon just really likes that name since he already had a company called X.com. Uh, but like most rebrands that I've seen tend to be more investor focused, like the rebrand from Facebook to Meta was not a rebrand of the Facebook product, but was actually a rebrand of like the value prop of what that holding company is. They have Instagram, they have Facebook, they have WhatsApp, they have all these things and that they, they were focused on the metaverse and AI. Um, the Google to Alphabet one is similar, like Google didn't change. But like Alphabet, this holding company, a new strategy to communicate to investors did change. Um, this one, the maker rebrand seems like both, right? When you change the token that someone's interacting with, like you're touching investors and consumers, which it, maybe it's just a consequence of the industry that we're in. So I think it's like interesting for that reason. Um, for what it's worth, I think it's kind of slick. Um, <laughs> I, I, I saw it get a lot of hate. I think Sky is a cool name. Uh, I think that the tokens, like the tickers, like, you know, I think that they hit a little better. Um, I think MakerDAO is the worst name on the planet, especially if you want to connect with investors. Like no one knows what a DAO is. I don't think investors want to know right now. Um, so I don't know. It, it's a big thing because Maker is such a high profile project. I don't know how much impact it'll have but i think on the margin it does make maker a little more palatable to trad by investor types which i think is important yeah seeing some overall agreement there on kind of the the rebrand for maybe investor or you know institutional appetite which uh, makes sense it's a little it's a little cleaner slicker like generally you know sky is kind of like a, a spotless name not not really related to anything um the more interesting thing is, sorry, how, how, um, like everyone loves maker, like it's so undervalued and I don't know, market cap keeps going down. Like why, like, why is that happening? I don't think the rebrand can save it, but I mean, for what, like 18 months, this has been a liquid token fund favorite. Um, the incremental buyer isn't there. You guys have any thoughts on why that is? Yeah, I mean, I think every, I mean, everything's been going down for the past um, couple of months for the most part, you know, except for a few coins. Um, I thought Maker was one of the um, the few coins throughout 2023 and and um, earlier in 2024 that um, actually kind of moved idiosyncratically um, apart from from Bitcoin. Um, it was um, one of the least correlated coins like if you just look at it like a basket of all coins and so it it was interesting like i think it really was trading um in accordance to like its fundamentals right as opposed to just speculation so um yeah maybe that that trade is starting to um unwind a little and i mean right in a in a speculatory environment maker is probably not going to be the fastest horse so I think now it's like, all right, like they had really strong fundamentals. The coin did really well for maybe the past 12 to 18 months, but now it's like they need to show another stage of growth before, um, you know, price goes higher. Maybe that's part of the rebrand, right? Like they want to make the coin um, kind of easier or just, you know, a little little shinier uh, new chart, something that that people want to speculate on as opposed to just being like a pure fundamentally driven token that right? Like funds might invest in, but like retail isn't buying, you know, MakerDAO, they're buying meme coins on pump.fun, right? Yeah, I, th I, I think that, um, well, there are, well, first and foremost, I'm not like a MakerDAO analyst or expert, so I'm not sure exactly like, you know, I don't know what specific metrics look like, 
but it strikes me that the stablecoin protocol slash lending protocol like market is is extremely competitive um and it's just obviously like i i try to remind myself that you know bitcoin's been around for a decade or, or more than a decade and these smart contract platforms i guess you could say they've been around since you know 20 the early the mid 20 2010s but really like in my mind um 2020 that's when kind of like De that's why that's when like ethereum and DeFi summer you know made a dent in people's you know mind share um so it's only we're only three we're only four years into these l1 smart contract platforms and um yeah i think it's hard to have conviction in any one lending protocol slash stablecoin protocol at this given at this point in time um and so yeah it's just a competitive market i think it's hard to see like more than six months into the future um when it comes to this like like short-term narrative driven catalyst. And then like even more broadly, um, I guess like I could speak for myself and the coins that I track. Um, ETH, having ETH exposure in your portfolio hasn't really done well. Bitcoin is still like somehow at least year to date, like outperforming ETH and Sol. Um, and Sol is obviously outperforming ETH. Um, and so I think like broadly speaking, if you're a liquid token fund or if you're just like an investor in crypto in general and you have a lot of exposure to ETH, um, which includes all the DeFi that sit on top, you're not really having a great year. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just the tokens that I'm tracking, but I'm thinking about LDO. I'm thinking about Uni. I'm thinking about um, Maker. I'm thinking about ETH itself. Um, and so I think like it's possible that people just want to diversify. Like people are looking a little bit more you know, outside of the realm of ETH. And then if they are thinking about ETH, they have to really think about like, not only what is driving the short term, but like how they fit into this long term picture, um, where, you know, chains like Solana can, 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 you know, um, compete. Yeah, I think maybe one other point to tap on for Maker as well is this, you know, focus on sub DAOs and maybe splitting out separate tokens for these, you know, different future potential products um, underneath kind of the main protocol. And and maybe that raises questions as to like, what's the true future value of Maker if like we're going to be breaking out all these different tokens that are each going to be, you know, governed and have their own different revenues. Um, you know, I don't know if the, the full clear model of um, how all that circulates or connects back to the main protocol is fully defined as of yet, right? Those, these are pretty long-term plans. So... Um, maybe there's just some, some uncertainty and doubt in terms of how that plays out long term um, and whether that maybe fully accrues to the kind of existing token or if the new tokens are going to be the, you know, a uh, primary benefit or instead of these newer products. Introducing like a second or third token to a project always adds like additional complexity that, um, you know, I don't I don't know that there are many cases where we see this super successful for like both tokens, at least. You know, and maybe, you know, there's, I could pull some up, but like Helium might be an example where like the HNT token is doing quite well. But like, if you look at mobile, for example, like, you know, it's, it's not quite the same. Um, and obviously there's different, the mechanisms are entirely different. It's not quite the same thing, but um, it's more complexity. It's more risks that, that people looking at these tokens have to consider. And if you're going to, if you're planning to have, you know, five, six sub DAOs and drop all these different tokens and have all those, that interplay, it's, that's a lot to consider. Yeah, I think sub DAOs make a lot of sense depending on how they're structured. Helium has a lot of really interesting things going on and Maker has those plans as well. I think that practically for the the where we are in the market and the cycle of adoption and who the crypto market participants are, um, it's not great. Um, it, you see this fragmentation in the Cosmos ecosystem where there's like clearly isn't like one thing to bet on to bet on that ecosystem. Um, like it, they tried to make it atom, but it didn't capture value. Then they added some things that didn't capture enough value. So like it's, it's just really hard. Like it's very easy for everyone who participates in Solana or ETH to find the single asset that really represents who they are and like create a narrative around it. Um, it's much harder to do that with like these splintered, like the splintered sub DAO, like go to market. And like, I think that's BS. Like, I, I think it's silly that people buying uh, are buying coins for that reason. I think it's silly that like, you have to kind of rally people around these singular financial objects to like make the project go. 
I don't think that that is a long-term thing, but it is like, it is the reality for now. So when you have these sub DAOs, like, I don't know, you have to tread lightly and, and, and um, like the, the messaging around that token matters. Like if you're one of the helium sub DAO things, do you even want to like talk about how you're part of the sub DAO? Like, I don't know. It's not clear to me that that is going to drive mindshare to your token and to your project. I think it's best that you like, I, you you can't you can't go to market with a fragmented message, and historically that's what kind of these like multi token systems have done. So we'll, we'll see what they do doing for uh, going forward. I also I also feel like the rebrand uh, is kind of just kind of this overall trend of of um the ethereum um narrative shifting um and so thus the protocols that have been built on top of it are also shifting and changing so i think i first like noted this when uniswap um literally started to take their transactions off chain like i thought that was the writing on the wall where the most ethereum aligned application on you know on mainnet is literally taking up execution off chain. Um, I thought that was like writing on the wall that, oh, if Uniswap is taking transactions off chain, then transactions will not happen, will, will, will increasingly happen in another, I guess, like context or stack. Um, and so I'm not saying like correlation is causation here with like the rebrands. Um, but there might be this element of like how Ethereum mainnet and the the narrative around mainnet has 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 sort of caused or helped influence like some of the DeFi apps changing their brands as they expand beyond the Ethereum Ethereum mainnet and even into thing even it's changed like MakerDAO is going to uh, Solana I guess they're using an SVN thing I don't I, again I don't know the specifics of that of that um, um, decision or development but also like. Avara with Ave going to Aptos, um, you know, things are changing, things are expanding to new chains. And so I think you kind of do want to be a little bit less Ethereum like centric. I think that's a great, great maybe segue into uh, another topic as well. That's been getting some, some traction and some, some heat um, lately among founders of different, <laughs> different protocols, different chains, even um around the topic of whether l2s are parasitic i think hayden you kind of started to comment on something related here like the eth ecosystem has sort of evolved like the messaging around like different tokens and different projects and like how they kind of market themselves and how they're thinking about expanding and building has kind of shifted as as people consider like you know weighing out the token itself versus like what the product is and what that's offering to users versus you know, maybe investors or, or, you know, institutions. And I think we're seeing this same kind of, um, you know, thinking going on with, you know, the, this kind of constant war that we've seen between, you know, the messaging of like ETH L2s being parasitic to mainnet because, you know, they're, they're capturing away the fees that maybe would have otherwise had gone to ETH um, versus, you know, the folks over in Solana um, trying to keep everything as much as possible on, on their main net. Um, there's been some discussion, I guess I'll, I'll try to frame this up a little bit from the conversation that occurred, but, um, you know, we had some, some folks, including Tolly, um, with Solana and Togrel from the scroll team, um, as well as Kyle Samani kind of weigh in on this topic around, you know, basically the discussion really boiled down to defining things that could have happened on the L1, but, but didn't, um, IE because they happened on some generalized L2 instead, um, are they're kind of arguing over whether or not this is parasitic to that, to that L1, you know, if you can, if you have Ethereum and it's this generalized, you know, smart contract layer, and then someone else drops their generalized smart contract L2 right on top, and then you just copy all the apps over and the activity is happening there. Like, are you just, you're just taking away and, and, you know, you get the benefit of only having to pay the, the low, you know, DA costs and you keep all that sequence of revenue for yourself. I think this is kind of maybe the point of contention. Um, and there's a little bit of back and forth here around um, folks in maybe the Solana ecosystem saying that some projects building there are um, different because um, they're maybe not going after this generalized route. They're going maybe more in a 
unique differentiated way by building maybe more app specific um, chains that aren't, you know, things that would not be possible to build on mainnet today. Um, curious on all thoughts here, whether we think generalized L2s are just generally parasitic to the L1, for example. I think that there is a, um, I mean, I think this, this question is a lot more complicated than just yes or no. Um, right. Like if, you know, multiple, a couple of years ago, the idea is that they wouldn't be, or they would be slightly parasitic, but the net benefit from having a lower cost execution environment that's going to drive significantly more um, transactions. And then those L2s would be, you know, paying um, rent to Ethereum, right? So in 2022 per month, um, or sometimes even per day, right? You're, you're seeing 65,000, you know, Arbitrum paying $65,000, um, I think at some points per day to Ethereum, right? Now post 44.4, the numbers drop significantly. And so, um, right, the the amount that they are parasitic has increased and the relative value that they added through, right, let's say um, some type of monetary premium by people needing to buy ETH on all these L2s, ETH, OP, or Arbitrum, OP, base, et cetera, to um, transact and that, and purchasing of that ETH um, increases the, the cost of that asset, um, which then in turn, in turn benefits Ethereum, right? Like clearly, um, there hasn't been enough demand for ETH to the point where these L2s are not parasitic, right? So I think, um, it, it, it's interesting, right? Like if, if ETH, the ETH would have to win by such a large degree and usage would have to increase by, um, you know, 10, 100 thousand X on these L2s, I think in aggregate for like real value to, to be returned to ETH from just like a pure, like monetary premium, um, perspective, but like, you know, obviously right now here, we're in the dog days and that's not happening. So, um, I know, yeah, we have a couple of salon experts here, so I'll, you know, let you guys talk about that. But I think from the ETH side, um, you know, this is a dynamic that, yeah, it's great for users, right? That fees are super cheap and you can, you know, just go straight to base. And I think, you know, even right now, um, gas, gas is comped by base, but in terms of ETH, the asset, uh, they have proven to be parasitic so far. So I think this is going to be a very interesting thing to monitor. I think it's highly reflexive. And if there, and if price does go up, let's say we have election, you know, better regulatory environment, um, ETH, ETF flows pick up. I think this conversation is going to change a lot, but I think we'll have a good framing for, all right, how much does activity truly uh, matter for the price of ETH? Um, and I think that's going to be interesting to see. What is your thinking around if, if price goes up, L2s are less parasitic? Like, like could you help me connect those dots? Yeah, so not necessarily price goes up, but right, like a large increase in number of transactions. So um, anytime someone buys ETH, right, uh, someone also sells ETH, right? Anytime you exchange any type of asset, the net selling is always de minimis. Um, what matters is did that exchange happen above current market price or below current or below current market price, right? Mm -hmm. So in the case of this, let's say you have to buy ETH to go, you know, buy some NFTs or do some DeFi stuff on base or Arbitrum, um, right? And by buying that ETH, you're causing the price to go up. ETH is interesting because the asset is pretty inelastic. So a lot of ETH is staked. A lot of ETH is bridged to L2s. Um, a lot of ETH is, um, is deposited in money markets, right? And so I think that as usage, as all this usage occurs, um, the supply becomes even more inelastic. And so when you have this kind of indiscriminate price insensitive buyer, right, that's just downloading a wallet and clicking market buy, um, the more inelastic an asset, the greater the spread. And so that market buy, right, moving into a passive bid above current market price, higher the spread, the more the price goes up. And so also, but as price goes up, um, the more you can take, you know, the more you can the more you're earning um, in yield that you can then rehypothecate, the more uh, money you can take out in loans that you can then 
you know, rehypothecate into other activities, right? So um, it's an it's an interesting case where price being higher actually does increase the fundamental utility of the asset. But it all starts with there needs to be some demand shock um, to kind of start that flywheel. Okay, I see. I see. Um, I don't, I feel like, where the reason why I think that L2s in their current form are parasitic is that the, that demand, like that demand shock you're talking about is, I mean, the way I think about it is that a demand shock to in NFTs on Arbitrum or base, um, is to have, in order to have that demand shock, you need to create, you know, there needs to be like a, an internal sort of, I guess, um, shift toward using these rollups um that are that aren't external necessarily they're, they're they're internal right there's like this application that is you know built on base that is attracting all these users for some new like type of crypto native like application um in that scenario i don't see how base is i don't see how ethereum gains from the execution and all of that, that activity, um, on base, I do see, like, I guess you could say that, oh, because base is bringing all these users and in order to use the app, they have to buy ETH. I can see that. Um, but I think that still the L2 is gaining way more from that, like roll up deployment of that application. Um, by having an L2 where they are not sharing any sort of like MEV or execution fees with the L1. Um, I think that's a, a, a mostly parasitic relationship. Um, it's still, it would still be mostly parasitic. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm just saying like the, the degree to that it's parasitic will decrease. And also I, I do think you have to take into account as well that the future state, um, I think of applications is that they're going to be chain agnostic, right? And they're going to use some type of interoperability infrastructure to create cross chain applications. And so under that scenario, um, <clears throat> they probably use some type of like intent based framework where um, execution is going to go to wherever it's cheapest at that, you know, current moment of time, whether that's on, you know, it could be literally any chain it doesn't necessarily have to be an L2, but um in that scenario, right? Like you have all these L2s that are competing for that, um, for that user demand. Um, and I guess like the, still like the one constant would be they'd, they'd all have to buy ETH. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, this is something that I've, I, I wrote about back in like March of 2022 because, um, uh, the founder of A Avalanche, uh, Eamon Gunser, like he, he used an analogy of like, uh, actually like L2s are like iguanas and um, iguanas would um, or competing male iguanas would go on to uh, other iguanas rocks and steal their um, they're like, I don't know, they're like mating privileges or whatever. Um, and so he compared L2s to iguanas and I, that's actually like really proven out today. Um, but like I said, clearly parasitic, but I, I do think that, that the narrative and, and that dynamic could start to change if there is a, if there is a large demand shock, but you're right. Like the L2s are going to make way more value from that shock in terms of like a relative basis than ETH. What's up guys for this week's Nillion snippet. I am joined by Ilya from Nier. Uh, thanks for coming on Ilya. For sure. Thanks for inviting me. Um, before we get started, uh, do you want to kind of go over what you guys are building over at Near, specifically in regard to AI? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, as many may know, Near is you know a big ecosystem with a lot of kind of different pillars. Uh, on the AI side, which we think is one of the fundamental technologies that kind of change how we interact with computing, the kind of important viewpoint that we took is how do you build a user-owned AI, like AI systems that are actually belong to the individuals and communities, not to for-profit companies. And uh, there's a lot of exciting companies in the ecosystem that are building different components, right? There's a data 
uh, you know, curation, there's crowdsourcing, there's different compute providers, inference providers. And so what we've focused on is how to bring all of these pieces together, as well as attract uh, kind of traditional AI researchers and uh, Web2 companies to start using all of these technologies together. And this will be relevant, kind of how Nilian fits into this as well. Perfect. And um, that's another thing I want to ask about is how are you guys working together with Nilian? Yeah, so Nilian is a kind of private compute and storage network. Um, and so there are quite a few use cases that uh, you can leverage it on. Uh, kind of to continue the AI story, right? Uh, as we build this user on the AI, it's really important that your you know, private data as a user is stored in you know encrypted way there's nobody else who can have access to it meanwhile you're still able to compute over it you're still able to you know retrieve it for uh you know in the applications that uh, need to have access to it or uh you know in the simplest case right it's part of your memory for the agents that are able to you know give you uh various um kind of uh, capabilities and so kind of it starts with, you know, integrating Nilian uh, kind of as this part of private storage for uh, private data, as well as compute over it, uh, providing this kind of private access for data um, on the AI cases. But it also expands beyond that, right? Um, so near being focused a lot on chain abstraction, kind of DeFi that is uh, <clears throat> abstracted out from which exact chain you're using it on, but the other part of this kind of chain abstraction is enhancing privacy. And so this is the other side where Nilian uh, can be contributing and will be contributing with, uh, for example, you're able to have um, private kind of encrypted order book where you can submit uh, encrypted orders it, uh, and it settles already uh, on chain in decrypted way. So in, in this way, Nilian kind of uh, where the private computation happens and near is where the settlement kind of decryption happens uh, near blockchain. So there's a few different kind of use cases across the board of, you know, the scope of near. Uh, but, uh, you know, it will start by kind of integrating uh, Nilian tech to be able to kind of interact with near and decrypt it. And then also allow the other way where kind of near accounts and near smart contracts will be able to uh, pretty much request for some type of compute uh, in the Nilian network. What are some exciting things coming up for Near over the next six to twelve months, and maybe specifically what Near and Nilian will be working on over the next six to twelve months? For sure, yeah. I think uh, again on on kind of this multiple dimensions, right? The this chain up chain abstracted kind of. Uh, use cases and DeFi specifically is something that we focused a lot and uh, we have a whole cohort of companies building uh, various technologies there and privacy will be one of the critical pieces because the competition actually is Binance where everything is private, right? Like nobody actually sees your balances in Binance, but everything is visible in blockchain. So we do need a way to uh, have a more uh, kind of private compute and private interactions there. Obviously, as we're going into AI and kind of creating, you know, a way to interact with blockchain with this chain abstracted application through natural language, through AI agents, you want to start, uh, again, having this private data inside AI agents accessible without anybody else seeing that. So like if AI agents computes over your private data, retrieves some context that you have and forms a transaction that, um, you know, will be executed you want to make sure that happens in a private privacy first way. Uh, I think there is, you know, all this like private data storage and computation over it, as well as use cases of kind of coordinating people, you know, be that DAO or uh, just in general deciding on uh, something. Again, this is where you probably want uh, private voting uh, in a moment and then potentially reveal results or reveal the votes afterwards right to reduce this kind of uh, peer pressure that happens right now uh and then again on the ai side i think we'll see uh interesting use cases around kind of uh potentially fine-tuning and other stuff as well over private data right imagine you have a model that uh contains private data that nobody else seen that 
you know, is fine tuned on uh, that now runs either, you know, on your behalf or on the, or autonomous completely as a kind of fully autonomous AI agent. And you can pair, you can assume that as almost like this AI characters that exists on chain that you can interact with. Uh, I mean, they don't need to be like fully on chain, but their information and DNA is stored on chain and kind of accessible uh, for people under certain conditions. So I think there's like a whole wide spectrum and kind of all of this is really exciting because we kind of now just have a lot more tools than just pure smart contracts to really create these rich experiences. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Ilya. Is there any place that listeners should go to to read more about Near and Near and Nilian's partnership? Um, I'm sure there will be a kind of blog post and everything coming out, but uh, I don't think we have a link yet. Fantastic. Well, um, thanks so much for coming on. All right. Thank you. The interesting thing about the discussion is that it often moves beyond the present. Right. So then we get people's forecast into what the space looks like. Is it going to be app chains? Is it going to be, are they going to juice the L1 and things come back? Like, is there going to be an interop standard where like, you don't even notice the change, the, the, the chains that the devs don't even notice the chains. Right. Um, and those get muddy and those futures are all probabilistic. There's another future that I don't hear people talking too much about the, um, when, when they frame these conversations, which is like, if it is true that a token can get value simply for having it as the base payment within an ecosystem, forcing that on users, there is some non-zero chance that the regulatory environment loosens up and for the base team to want to drive more value to base, they launch a token and they give you the option to pay for gas with BASE. Um, exactly. Use ETH or base. And then there's the option of like, oh, now you just have to use base or you can use any token. Like it gets really muddy when we like put these, like when we think about these like futures that are like so far away. Um, but, but my hunch today, like, is if the, you know, the holders of OP could force their users to pay for gas in OP or give them the option to do so. Um, I think most people in crypto believe that that would drive more value to the OP token and therefore that team would do so, right? So like, it's not even clear to me in this future state that we're all reasoning about that people will be forced to buy ETH to, to you know, use on these chains. Um, and like, you guys know how I feel about this. I think it's all cash flows, like give me the DCF. I don't think it, it matters that these people have, but that you have to buy the thing to transact as much as it does like the cash flows. Um, but, but, but even if you were to assume that that matters a lot, um, it's still not clear that, um, ETH can just like, ETH will just like circumvent all these L2s in some future state. And then you have to use it in all scenarios. Like there is a non-zero chance that chains move to use their own gas tokens for like fee transactions and paying for tips and execution. Yeah, Ryan, I think you bring up a good point, and I think it kind of actually harkens back to the MakerDAO discussion and like the Helium discussion around subDAOs. It's like, you know, we're not really in the same place anymore where all of the discussion is happening all the time directly in relation to like ETH, the network, and the token. Um, if we're getting to the point where like all of the adoption is happening on on base or on Arbitrum, and at some point these, you know, these DAOs and like the general, you know, community focuses on kind of building out the value prop for those ecosystems, those tokens, um, the, the conversation will kind of continue to shift like in this this future state where, you know, if, if the goal is to like expand, you know, Arbitrum, for example, and, and the usage of, you know, Arbitrum's technology and its tech stack and like maybe even the token and how it accrues value, et cetera, et cetera. Like you, you just get this natural shift in in reasoning and thought behind people like maybe running the Arbitrum DAO versus like what people are thinking about ETH and Ethereum. Um, you know, they need to look out for themselves and like, you know, if ARB wants to be successful, they're going to do like what's in their best interest. If that means they, you know, do whatever is possible to like pay the least amount in fees and DA back to ETH, um, then that's what they're going to do. Um, future state, this is like, like Ryan said, it's, it's pretty hard to reason about like five, 10 years down the road, but I think the point he makes is is good in that 
if you have 10, 20 of these like different ecosystems, they're not directly Ethereum anymore. They're like their own like sub DAO communities, essentially, like within this leveraging this ecosystem today, like the tech, um, you know, their their particular paths forward might continue to diverge a little bit. There might be things that they agree on, like generally um, about like, you know, best path forward for utilizing the network as like an L2 today. Um, but differences in how they approach like value capture for their tokens and for their ecosystems might be very different. And, and in doing so, they might go on like entirely different pathways um, in, in, in capturing that value. So um, I think like the points you make are, are, are good, Ryan. And I think it, it opens up like a lot of, you know, reasoning about these future discussions is really hard because it like anything could happen theoretically, but um, it, it kind of shifts away this point around, you know, if, if you look at ETH, you know, a few years ago versus today, it's just incredibly different. We're not reasoning about like, you know, in all cases, just improving ETH, the network itself and, and everything, you know, accrues back to ETH. It's like, we've got ETH and then we've got these layers built on top or underneath, however you want to visualize it. And then kind of going on and on from there. And, and you've got different groups of people making decisions at every step of the way. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the one, like the one rebuttal to that and um, like the one important thing to keep in mind is that um, yeah, like base could make their own token and branch off, but now, right. They are now running a uh, layer one. They need to run full consensus. They need to incentivize, um, a large distributed <clears throat> validator set. Like the reason why ETH created rollups in the first place is because let's say fraud proofs or CK proofs, um, can compress a large number of transactions and theoretically are cheaper than any form of consensus, right? Even if you have the most you know, advanced multi proposer proposer system, right? Like at the end of the day, when you separate execution from consensus, you get all these benefits, right? And so this now creates a new competitive marketplace where users are going to choose the execution environment with the lowest fees, right? So like as a thought experiment, if you clone Solana and made it an, an Ethereum L2, this, this Ethereum L2 would have the same fees as Solana, the same throughput as Solana, but instead of paying $360 million um, in inflation a month, it's now paying whatever, uh, $5,000, right, to, to, for its security. And so that, that spread between paying your, for your security from ETH as opposed to paying um, your, own, your own validator set to generate your own security, right, that spread res would result in that L2 now being able to lower its fees. And then the end user is just going to go to the place with the lowest fees which would be the, the roll up, not the L1. And obviously this, this is a hypothetical. This is a thought experiment. If you could clone Solana and make an L2, but I, I think it's important to approach this from these discussions from first principles, because right, that's how you, that's how you make predictions about the future. That's how you right think about the future state. And so I think, you know, Ethereum, like it, it, it scaled the, it, it, it's not capturing much value, but like, you look at gas costs right now and it kind of achieved its goal and it has all this, you know, really cheap block space. So like I said, I think we need to see what happens when, when there's a demand shock, but um, there, there is a reason for L2s, right. To exist, which is to reduce execution costs. That's just beyond like trying to capture its own value. And so, um, you know, in this scenario where, block space or on-chain trust minimized computation is deflationary and continues to drop over time. Um, and there is a further convergence between, um, you know, certain types of roll-ups and all L1s. And um, there is kind of a consensus around what is the best um, consensus mechanism. Um, as all those prices continue to drop, do we actually need a security hub like Ethereum? And is the best architecture actually separating execution um, from consensus. And so, you know, I think ETH is the leader there and it's, it's not clear whether a, mo whether a monolithic or, or modular architecture will produce, you know, the, the best experience for end users, i.e. lowest cost, highest security and decentralized, right? Coinbase is a single company. And the reason why we're all here um, which this is another topic, but Daniel, let you handle the transition is because of censorship resistance and that matters. Right. And, um, you know, I don't know how to value that, 
but I can say for sure that it's it might be the one um, it might be the one unique thing that blockchains have that can't be you know beaten out by centralized systems because if it's just all about speed and, and value capture you know just make your own centralized server i mean it depends what you're like talking about what you're referring to because like ethereum right now is not censorship resistant um like the way that the uh, the pbs auction works is 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 it's, it's actually quite the opposite there's only two two builders that get to build blocks um at least two builders make up around 70 to 80 percent of the entire market and so the way to get on chain at the moment um is to pay the highest amount to builders to include you in their block because the proposer is ultimately going to choose whichever block is has the that has the highest amount of mev um and so like from that perspective ethereum mainnet like not even thinking about the censorship problems that already exist on L2, which by the way, like their trust assumptions, like they, they're ultimately multi-sigs. Um, and so we're trusting them a lot. They can censor us completely if they'd like to, for some reason, but obviously they're not. Um, but like, even on mainnet, there's a high level of censorship. There's a, there's censorship resistant, but there's also a high level of censorship. And right now, like that's the whole discussion around like switching things to multiple concurrent proposers is to reduce it's to increase the, the centers of resistance. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with all that. I think that's like another discussion. I'm just saying in terms of the, right, the, the clear benefits of separating consensus, which obviously is, right, has its flaws, but separate and the execution side, which all these rollups are centralized right now. They don't, have, they haven't, other than like Metis, they haven't decentralized their sequencers. Um, but like in, like theoretically by separating those two, you can have a base layer that optimizes for low hardware costs and high decentralization. Yeah. I think, I think like, I think like looking ahead, I think the thing that we'll just have to keep an eye out for is like how these L2s are going to share some side of some sort of economic alignment with the L1. Um, like I'm not going to put any names out there, but yeah, I was talking to one of the team, one of the rollup teams and, um, I did mention how like, oh, it would be, it would be useful. And I think like you, you guys would, you know, gain a lot of value if there was some sort of thought leadership on how the rollup will at some point, like be less parasitic or, uh, you know, become economically aligned with the L1. I think like the space would like benefit from that. And even then it was still a question of how, like decentralizing the sequencer, right? Like there's rollup A. And you decentralize rollup based sequencer to like several nodes. Now many people can run the sequencer. Still, there's a question of how are you gonna like economically align those sequencers with the mainnet, with mainnet. And so, like, I guess it's this difference between like decentralizing the sequencer and like shared sequencing. Um, so, you know, I know my I know Mike was uh, you know talking about how like it all boils down to or not all boils down, but he was making some comments on shared sequencing on Twitter. I think it, I think we'll just have to like follow how all of these like infrastructure, um, all, all this additional infrastructure will enforce more economic alignment with L1. Cause right now there's zero, it's just like, you know, virtue signaling like, oh yeah, like we're, we're aligned with, with L1. Um, we're using ETH to burn, you know, for execution. Um, but like, yeah, you just played out the, the, the layer two would gain way more if they just had their own token. This is why the, I think the conversation, like we could all like, these are ideas, right? So like, this is how I feel about the ideas that works that we're all expressing. Like in, if you, if you talk to an executive of a, like a, at, at Azure, he's thinking about how to like make the best experience for his users, right? He's, he's user facing all of these kind con- like, why should a rollup have to share value with ETH? Like, that's not the point. The point is to create some base layer where devs can like build cool stuff, right? And like the 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 comment on on that the the point of these systems is is uh, censorship resistance, right? Like maybe that's a feature, but the the point of them is actually to like build cool stuff. 
Um, and the, the, and like empirically the, they've been used to build new assets to trade that are not available on TradFi rails. Like, I think that the question is incredibly backward looking. It's like, what do all the devs want to do that are a part of the ecosystem in line with their values, right? In line with their like political objectives and not like we have customers, we should build these things. So they're used by the max number of people. Like now, maybe that's not the goal. Like, I think it's clearly not the goal of the ETH people. They're clearly building, they, they're clearly building for like a political objective, right? Like they want this maximally censorship resistant cypher pug thing. Um, like reality is like, you're not touching the whole world with that thing. Like it's probably impossible. So like, who are you actually building for? Um, and a lot of these framings, they like, they look as the built, they look like Vitalik and the people around him are looking at themselves as themselves as the end customer. They're building for their ideology, not and not like the usefulness for the end customer. I think I think that that's a huge issue. Ultimately, maybe maybe to round out the point here, I think um, maybe it's maybe it's where I step in and say we're still so early. Things things are very unclear, undefined to uh, communities a across the board here a in within the ETH community, within the Solana community. Um, within other chain communities, it's not clear how maybe the end game incentives will play out and valuations will um, will actually work out for different chains and apps. Um, to the point around decentralization, permissionlessness, censorship resistance, um, there is a good point in terms of the value prop there. Um, we had some recent activity with um, the founder of Telegram, the CEO founder of Telegram, um, was recently arrested um, in France. Um, and it's somewhat related to, you know, telegrams, maybe unwillingness to cooperate with the authorities, give over maybe information on their users in some cases, or provide details, um, in regards to investigations and other things, um, which, which sort of goes, you know, directly against maybe some of the kind of the core DeFi ethos that, that a lot of people have, right. Um, you know, wanting to maybe be anonymous or, um, interact freely without, you know, question or scrutiny by governments, for example, um, I think is, you know, maybe a core tenant a lot of a lot of folks have. Um, I know Vitalik is certainly that's probably something in his mind. And he's mentioned as much recently um, with his comments on DeFi. Um, it, it does open up some questions here, though. You know, you can build a decentralized protocol, but um, we've seen that it it's, it's not enough to simply build a nice protocol. Um, the authorities can still, you know, arrest and detain founders of those protocols and people interacting with those protocols. So um, even if the thing is still running, if, um, you know, if Pavel and his whole team can get thrown in jail and, and people aren't going to be developing the ton network anymore, um, it, there's still vulnerability there, right? You can't completely sidestep, um, you know, the existing sort of um, legal frameworks in all cases. Um, you'll, you'll still get, um, essentially, if, you know, maybe the authorities don't agree with what you're doing, um, they have still ways of sticking their hands in the pot, so to say. Um, curious on your guys' thoughts there. I mean, Ton has had some both positive and negative comments lately. Um, one, you know, there was some some information shared in regards to you know, maybe their full crypto holdings, um, the amount of activity on their network, in um, and like the value of Telegram itself based on you know crypto related transactions and, and fees and payments. Um, they're kind of proving out like maybe a little bit of a unique use case there for a messenger app that we haven't seen before and that, you know, driving value through like fees of a, of a transaction network um, could, you know, maybe alleviate the fact that messaging apps kind of struggle from, you know, not being able to capture revenue in the same way that other social platforms have been able to with, with you know, the usual ad placements and other deals um, that normally work on places like you know, X or YouTube, et cetera, pick your favorite. Curious what you guys think there. Like, is, is, is Ton proving out something? Ton and Telegram, I guess, combined, really. Um, you know, are they, are they really proving out something novel here? Um, and does, you know, does this scat with or, you know, scrap with the authorities kind of uh, shake things up and question their, their uh, legitimacy or path forward? I, I think that, I think the, tele the importance of Telegram needs reframing. Um, Telegram, um, first off, like fantastic app. It's one of my favorites. It is incredibly smooth. Um, what they've been able to achieve as far as like large, like group message channels is like 
like WhatsApp and um, and uh, iMessage haven't been able to replicate that. So like good on them like that. That was their wedge um, there. Like, I think. I don't know if crypto knows this, but like Telegram chats like aren't by default encrypted. Um, you have to flip that switch on a per message basis. And like one thing it'll like really do is like increase the latency of that chat. Um, the other problem is that it's not end to end encrypted. So Telegram can still see all the stuff that you send to a group. They have it all on their centralized servers. It's encrypted between you and their servers, which is why the, um, which is why the authorities went after them because they have access to illegal things that are going on on their servers and they don't respond to those requests. Right. So like, I don't know, there's like been this framing around telegram being like, I don't know, in crypto specifically, like this kind of like cypherpunk app. And like, I don't know if it's necessarily true. Like I do think like that, that by not responding to the authorities requests to kind of limit this activity, like, I don't know. I don't know if that's great. Um, if you can see it on your server and it's very, very bad and it's easy for you to just put that bad person away, like I, it, it's hard to argue against that. Like there are obviously like First Amendment things. It's thorny, right? It's like pretty thorny. I don't even know where I stand on it. But like I think that that context um, is important. Um, I think it's a shame that this had to happen because um, there was a really good opportunity for telegram to build a crypto first like ecosystem which it seems like they were going to do like they came out with big announcements in q4 of last year q1 of this year um they've made a significant amount in revenue we find we found out from the financial times piece that leaked their financials uh, on crypto related things um and frankly like when you look at the financials like they really needed crypto to monetize. Uh, it's very hard to monetize a messaging app. It does not have a feed. And when you don't have a feed, you can't put ads all over the place because people don't want ads in like their messages, right? So like they almost needed it to work. It seemed like it was going to be a big priority. And the, the unfortunate thing is, is like now everyone on their team is like talking for lawyers, talking with lawyers nonstop. Like you can't push product and go to market in that environment. So whatever like telegram thesis you had, I think it extends the time horizon or sorry, ton thesis you had, I think it really extends the time horizon on it, which is a shame because I think USDT usage like was picking up in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, maybe it can over overcome that who knows, but like, I think that you have a lot of people in that ecosystem now that are like way more concerned about like the, like, like the knock-on effects from this arrest and what it means for them personally um instead of like building things over there which which sucks um to be honest you make a lot of really good points um i think my i'm just going off of like what my what my intuition from like experience is saying um and it's still too early to fade ton i think like their uh strategy which is starting with distribution um is something that like isn't it's an interesting experiment in within especially in the context that we're in right now which is like you know we we went from starting from bitcoin and then like having the cypherpunk perspective on decentralization and you know this whole cycle has been about solana um and you know like l2s and you know mev like you know parasitic relationships and does decentralization matter? And if it does, like what parts of it matter? Um, I think like starting off with like the customer, like distributing, like getting distribution first and then nailing down the consensus aspects of it, which I feel like I look through there, I, I'm like still going through their white paper um, on the ton blockchain ecosystem, like what exactly it is. Um, and it's it, it, it seems like some sort of like sharding consensus um, you know, so bringing back like the Ethereum sharding roadmap. Um, but yeah, like I think it's just interesting strategy to just have users and then from there, like build out, you know, a decentralized, you know, ecosystem or, you know, apps on top um, of the users.
yeah, it's 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 objectively like there aren't many ways to compete for an ecosystem um, nowadays. There are so many freaking blockchains. Like there's too many of them, and you can't like Solana could compete because there was this big fee difference. Like that's why it could compete. There's a big fee and latency difference that no longer exists. It's irrelevant to the end user in, in like mo in like in many cases. Uh, you can't compete on liquidity because Ethereum has it all. Um, you can't like so like what's your what's your go to market like it's frankly like an existing it's existing distribution like it's like this classic tech play where like you have existing distribution so like okay i'm gonna have a new product i'm gonna bundle it or i'm gonna like funnel my current users into it um base has that and ton has a lot more of, uh, a lot more of that so like really really interesting um yeah just like legal overhang is not good um it, it's really not good for building products um but it, it, it's also a little complicated too because you're seeing so many successful crypto native projects launch within the telegram app that are not using the ton blockchain like that's another weird thing and like does that ramp up so much that the network effects are like too big that like does it make sense to offer more than just just ton chain within the ton wallet like I don't know. I, I I could see, I could see some of these Telegram apps getting to that status because like, like if you're using a trading bot on Telegram, like that's effectively like Robinhood without borders. Like like today, Robinhood has borders. If you're Robinhood, you can't launch in China, and like if you want to launch in India, like you have to talk with the regulators, and it takes like six to eighteen months, and then you have to like spend all this money. But like if you could just launch a Telegram bot. Like you effectively like your, your, your end user bases, whoever can access that user base within telegram, like no regulatory stamp of approval, uh, stamp, stamp of approval required. Like that's super interesting. So like, I don't know if one of the, one of these apps, if it can create that Robin hood, like experience within telegram, like it's interesting to see how the telegram foundation or like whatever that like the telegram business will treat like access to that new chain because like solana's all over telegram ethereum's all over telegram um and those things print so they like they're they're not irrelevant either yeah i was going to bring up the dexbot apps as well because i think like you're saying it, it's a perfect example of how telegram is being used today for like crypto native apps um but those revenues are driving to those teams and not to like ton or, or that chain in, in most cases um, the top like Dex trading bot apps are, like you said, on Ethereum, on Sol. Um, they're charging like maybe a one percent take rate on volumes for their users. They're they're raking in a ton of money. They've done like over three billion in aggregate volume and since like the inception of that market category, um, which is just an absolute ton of money. Or sorry, thirty I think thirty billion excess of thirty billion in total trading volume um, since the inception of that category. So like there is clearly a market for what I think maybe the right terming or designing of it is like putting the action where the users are interacting. Um, we're seeing this with other things like Farcaster frames, like with Solana blinks, like trying to get those experiences like directly into their users, existing social feeds and networks. Right. And, and Dexbot apps are the same thing, right? Like you put, people are using Telegram like crazy. They're, they're chatting, they're messaging, they're talking about stuff. They're talking about crypto in there. You put their favorite Dexbot app, within the app as well and so now it's like you know they're talking about meme coins and then they're trading them all within the telegram app um although like you're saying ryan it's like not clear how some of these things accrue to telegram as a ton today because they don't most of them don't leverage that existing network at least they're very very successful and popular ones um but maybe they have some leverage to go after that you know like if you were to launch an app on the on the app apple app store like they're going to take a big cut um it's not that I don't think it's the same case today. You know, if you launch a Telegram Dex bot app, they're not they're not skimming thirty percent off of you. Um, but maybe that is a lever that they have. We'll we'll kind of have to see. I think they are. I guess in sort of the power seat of if all the users are on Telegram and that's that's where they're using the apps. You know, um, there's not really like the quick and easy. You can't just go over to Facebook Messenger and build you know your Dex bot apps there if the people aren't using them in the same way. So they do have a lever there if they need to. You know, have some means of of you know maybe forcing payments via like the APIs that these people are using to build these apps within Telegram. 
um, or have like more structured and detailed like payment or uh, other plans to like kind of capture some of that value flow. But today it's like not quite, I think, accruing to them. Um, just, a, just a quick point um, that might be um, interesting to kind of see how the market's positioning is um, the news on um, Pavel getting arrested. That was six days ago. Price is currently lower. Um, typically, if you have some type of negative news event, um, pertain, like regarding an asset, um, come out. If price doesn't respond negatively to that news, so there's like a failure on that, um, that could indicate that the asset's bullish. So if Ton can, um, you know, it's currently around five bucks, if it can recover 550 and show strength, even with this negative news, that would be, um, that would that would appear to be a pretty bullish setup, not financial advice. Got to end. The, always got to end the show with uh, price targets, financial advice. Sorry, do your own research. NFA, of course, as always. Any other, any other last comments, ideas, thoughts before we close out today, boys? I have a question. I just want to wrap up on like what the thesis is around like how L2s are not parasitic if they take execution fees, both execution fees and MEV. So the, the monetary premium that they add from people needing to buy ETH has to be so great that it accounts that it's greater than, like you could say, the, the, the parasitic elements, right? Um, and so you could think of it as Ethereum's failure to scale rapidly caused them to lose out on all this additional potential revenue. Um, but then, you know, they still might be able to, you know, claw some value back through, you know, just that ETH kind of like high velocity monetary premium um, argument. But that would have to be significant. And so that has the potential to be insignificant if the asset's highly inelastic, but it's entirely empirically based and we'd have to, we'd have to see what happens. There would have to be a demand shock to kind of empirically measure that. I think that's pretty well explained. Like you're basically like one has to outweigh the other. The monetary premium has to outweigh like the d decline in execution fees at the L1 or whatever. I just think like if you're transacting, if you have blockchain A and in order to use blockchain A, you need to have asset A and that right there is just like why you would end up having a stronger, a bigger monetary premium for asset A, because you need to hold it in inventory in order to write state, in order to update state. Um, so they're like a, there's like a cyclical relationship, basically. Like, like need, need, need A to, to write to blockchain A, and you need to pay fees in A. And then in order to do that, you need to buy more A. And then that is just kind of, you know, like the cyclical relationship um, that I feel like does add to monetary premium. Yeah, yeah, the, the mechanics around it for sure. Um, it has to be, it has to be that way. It has to be a self-reinforcing mechanism. Um, the interesting, like my framing around this, it's like kind of funny when you frame it this way, right? Like the ETH L1 was basically like having a discussion one day, like all the key stakeholders and they were like, you know, how are we going to drive the most value to the ETH token? And there was all these ideas and a bunch of them boiled down to just like fees. Like we're going to get fees, like every other business in the history of the planet, like we are going to drive fees to the token. And then someone was like, no, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have, we're going to forget about fees. We are going to try to accomplish like the, one business model that has not been successful for anything other than a nation state in human history, we're going to create money. Like, it's kind of like an absurd proposition, right? Like what, what, what private company has been like, you know what, I'm going to create some money. And that's going to be my go to market. Like it's never worked out. Um, it's a it's a bold, it's a bold move. It's a very, very bold move. Um, and look, maybe they accomplish it. Who knows? I think that's a good place to end it. I will say maybe on the comment on what corporation has tried to uh, create their own money, we maybe have the early example from Facebook that they um, 
had a lot of pressure on their DM projects. And now we have Sui and Aptos um, as sort of a, a spin out result of that. Um, yeah. Anyway, thanks for coming on, guys. This was a great discussion. Um, glad to have you all on, and uh, we will see you all next time. Get better, Boccaccio. <laughs> Get better, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. See you later.